Good evening. I'd like to welcome you all to the College Roundtable on Democracy in Crisis, Lessons from Ancient Athens. I'm James Sparrow. I'm a member of the history faculty. I'm a modern US historian of politics with a special focus on war and society. I'm also the person in the college who's responsible for the social sciences core curriculum. Tonight, we're going to be conducting another of our quarterly college roundtables. Each quarter, we feature a deep dive exchange on topics that may enliven our shared intellectual life and the core. Last fall, we invited Jill Frank, a political theorist at Cornell, to give a lively talk on the place of lies in Plato's Republic. It was a very helpful way to, to dig into the question of fake news and, and uh, the role of uh, truth versus falsity in politics while keeping it anchored in Plato's Republic and the readings of the Sochkor. Today's discussion is also timely with election day just on the other side of the weekend. To help us think about democracy in crisis from the perspective of the ancients, we have three political theorists who should be familiar to many of you. All three teaching classics of social and political thought. Demi Cassimus is a member of the political science faculty. She's the author of The Perpetual Immigrant and The Limits of Athenian Democracy, which came out um, with Cambridge University Press in 2018. In addition to this work on the basis of belonging in classical Athens, she's published essays on secrecy and its implications for democratic theory. She's also done some work on rumors that I think might be relevant to our discussion today. Our next panelist is Matt Landauer. He is also a member of the political science faculty. He's the author of Dangerous Counsel, Accountability and Advice in Ancient Greece. That came out uh, with the University of Chicago Press in 2019. Like Professor Cosimus, he's also an expert on classical democracy. He's published a number of essays on the public sphere in ancient Athens, including an article on the history of political thought on, on parousia, or the tradition of frank speech in confronting the tyrannical abuse of power. Today, we might talk about speaking truth to power. And that also is quite relevant to our conversation today. Our third panelist is John McCormick. Professor McCormick is yet another member of the political science faculty on this panel. He's the author of several books, including Reading Machiavelli, which came out in Princeton by, with Princeton University Press in 2018, and Machiavellian Democracy, Cambridge University Press 2011. He's written extensively about what we, what we might call the dark side of democracy in modern thought. Well, so I've got to open by observing that I'm, an, I'm a modern historian surrounded by a bunch of theorists <laughs> who work on much earlier periods of time. So my first instinct is to gain a little historical perspective. And what I'd like to do is to open up the conversation with a question. And then from that will flow a roundtable discussion among the four of us. And during that discussion, I would like to invite the audience to send their questions to us through the chat. And we'll be monitoring those as they come in and we'll try to incorporate them into our discussion. But if that's not possible, if there are too many questions, we'll, we'll take the questions at the end of the conversation somewhere around uh, the hour, somewhere around 7.30 Chicago time. So please, as we begin this conversation, queue up your questions and we'll try to get to them. So the question I'd like to start with has to do with how we're blinded by the emergencies of the present moment and by contemporary understandings of how democracy is supposed to work. And it's exceedingly difficult to think clearly in an emergency. Now last year, we've confronted a cascading sequence of emergencies, wildfires, pandemic, economic precariousness, police brutality and civil unrest, political violence and contestation around the election, these developments have exerted a, a baneful influence on our ability to grasp precisely how and why our democracy is imperiled. 
our inability to take stock of these rolling disasters and of the larger democratic failures they represent is further amplified by our national version, sorry, by what one might call the smugness of American present mindedness, which is our national version of the modern consent condescension of the living toward the dead, which historians constantly uh, confront in their work. So today, there's a near universal agreement across the political spectrum that democracy is in severe crisis. And undergirding this agreement is the assumption that ordinarily, democracy is characterized by stability and consensus. This, I would argue, is a legacy of the Cold War in which the United States relied on democratization as the banner under which the extension of its power around the world was justified in the context of geopolitical competition with the Soviet Union and economic ambitions to develop the third world as it decolonized. Earlier political thinkers, however, including our founders, did not make that assumption. So what I was hoping we could do at the beginning of the conversation is just step back a bit from the press of assumptions and preoccupations in this fraught moment we're in and discuss how taking the long perspective on democracy, yeah, actually, you know, the longest possible perspective going back to its origins in ancient Greece um, to give us fresh insight into the special strengths and vulnerabilities of democracy. Noise and confusion have played such a big role in disrupting our democracy. We're in great need of some perspective, I think, and who better than the ancients to provide it. So with that, I'll, I'll turn the conversation over to our panelists and, um, and ask you to, to, to take up the conversation from there. Great, so I'll, I'll just um, get us started. Those were some, some wonderful um, observations and, and provocations. And I, I think that the first thing to say is that um, for the ancient Greeks, for the Athenians in particular, um, regimes were fragile. They were, not, um, they were not fixed. Political change was, was something that, you know, you know, Plato and Aristotle write um, about, about change, about change um, at the moment that it leads to, or what, what can, what can go from from sort of there's a sort of political flux, but when does it become um, collapse, and what tips what tips that balance? Um, and so when we think about what the what the critics of democracy were concerned with, it was um, it was first and foremost the the kind of um, the balance that existed between the the poor and the rich in democracy. And so to take a step back and try to understand, you know, what could cause um, a crisis in democracy, we need to talk a little bit about what a democracy meant for, for the Greeks. Um, you know, Aristotle here is, is probably um, the one to turn to because he really thought that the most important sort of angle or lens onto democratic politics was this, this conflict between the rich and the poor. Um, and democracy, if you break it down, um, etymologically, uh, the two Greek words are demos and kratos. So it's really people power. It's, it's the strength of the people. And who are the people? Well, in a democracy, Aristotle thought they are usually, there are always the poor. So it is rule by the poor over the rich, which means that there's a kind of relation of, of domination there that is also fragile. And that, um, equality or that relation of um, between the, the rich and the poor, which always sort of was potentially um, destabilizing or destabilized um, and dependent on you know what else was going on in, in the Greek world. So I wanted to just sort of start there um, because what we see with, with um, conflict in classical Athens, which is what we're talking about, um, is, I mean, in order to kind of name it, the Greeks had a term which they, the term was stasis, and that came from a, the Greek verb histeme, which meant, could mean um, a kind of it, taking a stand. So it doesn't necessarily mean civil war, although it could become a kind of civil war, but importantly, it meant um, two sides, maybe factions, um, people who occupy positions that somehow cannot, they cannot reach an agreement. So even though the Greeks thought that conflict was a sort of just a, this condition of politics, there's disagreement, right? When we got, talk about stasis, we're talking about something else, um, a kind of almost uh, 
freezing in an agitated state of, of frozenness. So there's kind of motion and rest at the same time, um, which I think would, you know, should resonate a lot uh, for us today that could tip over into violence. It could tip in, over into um, regime collapse, but in that state, people are really um, vulnerable to, um, to suspicion. Um, and, you know, here I just wanna sort of flag that the first thinker to really try to theorize stasis and think about the different symptoms um, and who equated it with disease, with epidemic, with Thucydides. And the things that he mentioned, um, which I think we'll kind of keep circling back to, were things like um, lawlessness, a uh, kind of despondence, uh, hopelessness, uh, semantic instability where words sort of don't, they don't change their meaning necessarily, but they take on different value. So for instance, reckless daring becomes a sign of a uh, kind of party loyalty. So you risk things, you do dangerous things that um, you know are still dangerous, but they carry a different meaning in society. Uh, and that kind of internal division, which you know, also kind of, it spreads, it becomes a kind of affliction. And that's why he thought that it was, was good to think about it in terms of, um, of a disease. Um, Demi? So, yeah. Can I just ask you to, sure. to elaborate on one point of what you just brought up? Yeah. Um, you talked about factionalism as right. well, but um, the main opposition you've described is the poor versus the rich. Mm -hmm. Presumably there were factions among the poor and some of them were sponsored by or secretly organized by the rich. So um, how, how was, uh, how was the sort of the, the balance between the people, the many and the few, distinguished from sort of factional scheming and maneuvering and sort of, uh, um, you know, pseudo democracy or, you know, the sort of attempts to capture the people for the purposes that are anti-democrat. But maybe I'm also getting ahead of the conversation. No, I mean, I think that that's, that's also a question we could, I could punt to, to Matt, because I think it's a question really about how people can be um, persuaded by demagogues to um, sort of act actually against their own interests. Um, so I, I still would stand by the, the thought that, or the point that, that the major lines of division are between um, the rich and the poor, but there are these figures who sort of traverse that boundary and um, are, you know, the ones who are, they could be from among the people um, and not necessarily among the wealthiest, you know, um, populations of, of uh, Athenian democracy, but nevertheless um, be working to mobilize the demos um, to either be sort of more, um, to be friendlier to oligarchy, or we haven't mentioned the word oligarchy, but that's really the regime that's always kind of like, um, right there as an option. Um, and it was an option for 11 and for three or two times when oligarchs successfully um, conspired or used force to overtake um, Athenian democracy. So Matt, maybe you wanna say a little bit more about how um, people were able to be captured by these forces. And Matt, Matt when you answer, I, I just, I wonder if you would mind, or you too, Demi, answering uh, or, or relating it to, to the current moment. For example, I can't help but wonder what would, you know, what would, what would um, Athenian Democrats make of dark money? Does that look like what the oligarch maneuver to take over the, the polis looked like? Is it just a radically, it's just an, a bad anachronism to, to think of those as being essentially very similar kinds of things? But, um, I don't mean to interrupt. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll pick up on a few of the things things Demi was saying, um, and, and I'll, I'll get to the, the Jim, your, your question about sort of how factionalism can be thought of other than the, the main cleavage between rich and poor. But, but I think Demi is exactly right that that, that is really the, the core cleavage. And for Aristotle, I mean, you have to think, right, unlike, unlike our democracy, uh, or at least our, our, our polity, if we, if we want to withhold judgment of what kind of regime it really is. But I, unlike our polity, uh, Athens is not really a pluralistic society by and large, right? So everyone is from the same town. 
almost everyone. Uh, and Damien, you, you might want to bring in stuff about immigrants too, but, uh, but most of the citizens are people who are from Athens. And so when Aristotle is like thinking about the, you know, the sociology of the city or the anatomy of the city, he's trying to think about what are the cleavages uh, that are relevant in a, in a society where people share religion, they share an ethnic background, they share uh, you know, local identity. And the one cleavage that he thinks, and he looks around the Greek world and he sees there is a cleavage that, that, that is real and that's, that's the rich and the poor. Uh, and so, even, and then, you know, just, I'll say a little bit too, I think, which was, I think, implicit in some of the stuff Jamie was saying, but I'll, I'll, I'll bring it out a bit more too, because I think uh, to understand what democracy was, we also have to ask why democracy was important, right? And so why did ordinary citizens care in the ancient world, in ancient Greece, whether they lived in a democracy or in another kind of regime? And I think, uh, my understanding, my reading of fifth and fourth century Greek history is that citizens came to the judgment that only in a democracy, that is only in a city, uh, as Demi said, where ordinary citizens understood as you know, the poor many majority of the, of the citizens wielded real political power, only in such a regime would their interests be promoted and would they, be, would, would they have a chance of being treated like like equal sharers in the constitution. So for Aristotle, the language of understanding how political membership is often thought of as sharing in the constitution. And democracy is the regime where ordinary people have a, have a real share, a real stake in the regime. And so, so you know, the, the, main, the, main, the main divide is over whether people who don't have land, they're not well-educated, they don't, they don't have, they're not rich, they're not from a fancy old family that traces their lineage back to some dead hero. They're just ordinary people, farmers, craftsmen, wage laborers, whether they really count. Uh, and and that, that was the big cleavage in ancient Greece, whether people like that counted uh, politically. And so, you know, the, the reason why, you know, so, so to get to the point about other kinds of cleavages, right? So, you know, in, in Athens, there weren't factions like political parties. There, this is a debate that's gone back and forth in like the historiography of ancient Greece. You know, were there political parties in, in ancient Greek democracies? But it seems likely the answer is no. And you know, political disputes were organized around speakers. Uh, so you know, people would get up and speak in the assembly and try to persuade their audience of what they should do. And then they, they sometimes found it helpful to make populist appeals and demagogic appeals, and we can continue talking about that too. Uh, but, but they did organize by and large into, into kind of you know, ideological factions that tried to mobilize resources in favor of their coalition at the expense of others. Uh, so that, that wasn't really how, how political conflict was organized. So I guess the, the question I have is what in, you know, this is a different society, right? They don't have a state in the sense that we mean the state, the basis of wealth and, and, and um, the economy is very different. And yet it seems like there are some commonalities that, that we can relate to, not just some abstract concept of inequality. So how did, how did the, the few wield power in, a, in the context of, you know, of, of, a, of the functioning phase of Athenian democracy. You know, they must have had to have tread lightly or carefully. Yeah, Demi, do you want to come in on this? Yes, yeah, so I, yeah. I think, you know, the way, you know, the way that the wealthy exercised power was through influence, right? So, so if you were, especially if you were a good speaker, uh, you could, you could uh, wield power that way. Uh, and then they also wielded power because the, 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 the Athenians needed their money and were persuaded not to expropriate them. Uh, and so they, they, you know, they paid taxes and they, they bought warships and things like that. And in return, they, they probably got a, got a good say in what happened with those ships. But, but basically, right, so I think the, the way the Athenians saw the problem of, cap, of class conflict was uh, you solve it by rigorously surveilling and controlling your political officials, and uh, you have strict accountability institutions that that make sure that 
what they do is in line with your interests and your wishes. Uh, and you pay the poor to participate so that the poor are, are able to exercise power uh, on a regular basis. And, and that, was, that was what they were trying to achieve. It might be also useful to think about a historical example along um, those lines, right? So if you think about you know, during what we're, what we're referring to as the period during the Peloponnesian War, um, which especially for the second half, so that was about between 431 and 404, by 415 for sure, um, things were not going very well for the Athenians in the war with Sparta. And it is around this time that people become, I guess you could say, particularly um, susceptible to um, persuasive arguments um, either against democracy or you could say um, arguments about oligarchs kind of waiting in the wings, and they were waiting in the wings, to overtake democracy. So it might be interesting to think about what what is kind of going on on the ground? How did that actually, you know, work? And I think, you know, for people like Plato who are writing, you know, several decades later, looking back, you know, one way to understand what happened, or at least in Thucydides accounting, I think is that there are these specific ambitious individuals who were able somehow to, um, I mean, maybe this is sort of what you mean, Matt, I don't know if you use the word demagogues or I attributed it to you, but but these demagogues who were um, capable of, of persuading people to, um, to back oligarchic regimes, like in 4, in 412, 411. Um, so that's an interesting case because I mean, to go back, Jim, to your point about sort of what is common between the two. So there are very different mechanisms, very different institutions. We're not talking about an indirect democracy, we're talking about direct de democracy, nevertheless, you know, there's, there's some sort of social forces and say even like political emotions that become really, um, I think, useful and they seem resonant when we, when we compare between the two. Um, there's resentment, there's, um, you know, the rich feeling like the poor are becoming actually more empowered because they're becoming more important to the war effort. Um, and so there's a kind of erosion of, of um, at least, I don't know if there's an erosion of, of clear socioeconomic distinctions, but the sorts of privileges that might go along with being among the elite in Athens um, and the fear that, that whatever balance was existing might be, might be lost. Um, Matt, I don't know if you, if you wanna add anything about what it might've sort of been like on the ground, like how it might've, what would have made people sort of um, uh, or made democracy vulnerable to to capture by by oligarchs. Yeah. So, and, and I I think it's actually like a, a really interesting question. Uh, what 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 does it take to make a citizenry who at one point in time are committed to democratic values and to democratic procedures? to lose that commitment mm -hmm. uh, and to, to turn, you know, to basically look at democracy as a kind of failed experiment and look for something different. Uh, and so, I mean, in my mind, my, on my reading of, of Thucydides and Aristotle and Xenophon and other people who have written about the oligarchic, so, so a little historical background, Athens is a democracy for most of the fifth century BC and as Demi's already said, there are two instances where the democracy is overthrown towards the end of the fifth century, in 411 and 404, 403. Uh, and these, the, uh, these kind of brief oligarchic regimes, they don't last very long and democracy is ultimately restored after each of them. And if you look at the sources, I think there's not really agreement in, this, in, our, in our literary sources over whether the people were ultimately like persuaded to give up on democracy. So that is like, finally, you know, they were just like, you know what, democracy is just not working for us. Let's try something different. Or whether they were sort of like semi-persuaded, semi-compelled. Dima, do you want to come in on this? Yeah, because I think that's really important, right? I mean, when we think from a contemporary standpoint about democratic erosion, the reason that that's become uh, such an important uh, term 
is that we're trying to capture as political scientists or you know people in the in the media or public discourse something that is not like an actual collapse but that seemed to happen almost um imperceptibly right so matt when you say um were people really kind of actually opposed to democracy no probably not but they looked the other way or, um, you know, so, so, so the question is how regimes can sort of subtly shift, become hybrid regimes. Aristotle's really interested in this. And also to your point, you know, he's interested in how stasis can emerge from very small things because whatever is on the ground is already sort of, you know, there's people are kind of, um, they're feeling resentment. They might be feeling indifference. They also start to mistrust each other. So they think other people are plotting. Right, and they don't sort of rely on the same sorts of familial ties or social ties that they used to, uh, and um, I think that kind of that contributes to this environment in which you know somebody can actually um, be quite convincing. But I don't know if it's such as like this willful assent to like oligarchy. It's not. It's not necessarily that at all. It's kind of just like opting out or thinking. Um, that you know things aren't necessarily changing in in a kind of um, consequential way, I guess. Yeah, and, and I think what, what, what I think Demi's point brings home is that is why these moments of crisis are so fraught because you know I think I think it takes like you know I think for so what happens in Athens is in like four four eleven uh, there's a final assembly meeting where they basically abolish the democracy. Some guy gets up before all the people who have political rights and says, I want you to take one more vote. I want you to vote that you won't take any more votes. And they vote on it. Now, whether they're like, they vote on it, there's like, the Spartans are invading, the oligarchs are killing all their leaders, uh, people are dying on the streets. Like Demi's saying, there's rampant conspiracy theories, there's, you know, there's, uh, total mistrust of each other. There's, you know, frustration and being sick of it all. And, but, but they, they do, they're sort of manipulated or forced or they're too sick of everything not to, but they do take this final vote. And I think, I think that, you know, that, that seems so impossible. And yet now we're living in a world where it no longer seems so impossible. I think you start to see, you know, what, what, what makes it seem, seem, seem less, less a crazy scenario when you live I feel a little bit like we've started in media res and and we're talking about the the destabilization, um, but there are some elements of what made democracy possible in the first place that would could be helpfully fleshed out and would connect the ancient world to our world. So one of them is this context of war that you've both mentioned. And that seems significant. I mean, my own work is about World War II and you know, wartime does help uh, strengthen a sense of, of collective obligation and community. It certainly brightens the lines between the we and, and them, um, but it also creates a, a very strong sense of, of communal uh, egalitarian obligation, even if it's not universal and, and totally equal. So I, if you could just talk a little, speak to the context of war, which is also maybe potentially destabilizing the fear of internal enemies, et cetera. Um, and another external context is uh, raised by Molly Jones um, in the audience who wants to know about um, immigrants. And I, Demi's obviously written about this, but um, I'd like any of the three of you to, to speak about maybe how migration, yes, yeah, John's holding up Demi's book, uh, you know, how migration and the presence of immigrants who are treated as outsiders. It's not everybody just in one big town, but they've actually come from other lands. Um, so how that, uh, that external context also maybe have, you know, put some boundaries or put some limiting conditions or, or goals. Um, and then there are some internal things to talk about, but let's just deal with those two external contexts. War and immigration. Um, okay, uh, well, I can definitely talk about immigration. I can talk about war, but I could also divide this up. And Matt, do you wanna say something about the Peloponnesian War or should I just, just go? Okay, um, I mean, one, one, I'll leave more of the war.
stuff to you because I'm going to talk about immigration, but they're linked, you know. So in 431, um, which is the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War, I mean, so Athens goes from being a kind of underdog that beats the Persians, you know, the per Persian War, goes from, from, from being this sort of small city state that with the help of other Greek city states defeats the kind of the symbol of autocracy, actually. Um, and then in the form of Persia. And over time, builds up a kind of what, what emerges out of that war is a kind of coalition or a league of these Greek city states that are sort of working together, but over time Athens becomes a kind of hegemon. And instead of treating the other city states in the Greek world as allies, starts to treat them as sort of subjugated peoples. And um, at least in Thucydides' account, there's a kind of growing tyrannical, there's a, a tyrannical orientation to these other Greeks um, that is important for thinking about how democracy inside Athens also changes. So we have this, it's not just a war, it's a kind of em empire. And um, the war breaks out in that context with different city states uh, on different sides between Athens and Sparta. And so the reason that that's important is that you've got this kind of, it's basically an inter-Hellenic conflict. It's not the Greeks versus the Persians. Um, it's sort of within one ethnos, even though these are different city-states speaking different dialects of, of Greek um, and you know, Athenians distinguish citizens from other Greeks. I mean, Athenians distinct, citizens had to be of Athenian descent on both sides. So. Um, this is important because it also means that in this moment, there's not there's a ton of mobility in the Greek world after the Persian War, um, with people settling in Athens from places as far away as you know Syria or Egypt, but also really close by um, Corinth, and they are uh, kept disenfranchised generation after generation on the basis of blood, even though they're free. And those people were were called medics. So there are slaves in Athens, and as someone else you know in the Q and A. Uh, mentioned, you know, uh, Athenian citizenship is it's exclusionary in the sense that, you know, women, even Athenian women who were technically citizens, did not have the privileges that we typically associate with um, citizenship. They were they were excluded from the formal institutions of democracy, the kind of public, the public um, dimensions. Although they participated in in religious rights, which the Greeks thought were civic. Um, okay, so in this in this context. Um, there is, I mean, the war is clearly um, in some sense beneficial to the Athenians economically, but very slowly, I mean, sorry, very quickly um, goes south and, and um, becomes not only increasingly risky, but a kind of drain on, um, on Athens financially. And um, I wouldn't say that there's anything, any reason to think that, that immigrants become they're not really kind of mobilized in this. They don't. They don't make demands. There isn't that much of an interest in extending citizenship to them in this context. But they are important militarily. I mean, they are fighting on behalf of the Athenians in the Peloponnesian War, uh, and so there is this question about um, you know what it means to be a, a citizen if you are acting. Like one, so I could say more about some of these conflicts and how they might relate, but it's not immediately apparent to me. I think uh, along the lines that Matt was raising, the points he was raising before, I think the the more important cleavages are economic and medics could be. They were among some of the well, they weren't all like this, obviously, but they they in some cases, like the people in the Republic who host Plato's Republic, they could be some of the wealthiest people in Athens. I'm struck by the similarity to the American experience, not just to be an American who projects everything from America outward, but you know, the United States leading the allies against um, fascists in World War II, mm -hmm. and then leading um, <clears throat> its own alliance against the Soviets. Um, and also American immigration opens up in 65 as, uh, as a consequence in some ways of those um, wars in, in Southeast Asia. And that's what transforms the United States, ends the period of restriction, opens up this multicultural America with people coming from parts of the world who really hadn't been in the United States before. And it's part of American empire and, and hegemony. And then that produces a lot of, you know, politics of resentment, as you were talking about, you know, this kind of pushback. Um, obviously, there's some important differences, but um, 
so would you say then that that the presence of people from around the Athenian Empire was destabilizing or or and or helped expand the concept of who the many were because medics were kind of like slaves but kind of like uh, members of the polity, uh, um, you know, obviously um, th they were probably different positions uh, in the populace, but. Yeah, that's a good question. I would, I, I would say that, you know, legally, historically, there isn't this expansive notion of Athenianess or citizenship, but for the theorists who are criticizing Athens and interested in thinking about what democracy really is, I think there is most certainly a question about who really makes up the polis, who makes up this city, who makes a democracy run. And you know, one, one of the things that I've, you know, I've always thought about Plato's Republic is that it matters that this is set um, in the port of Athens, in a kind of famously immigrant area, that it's in an immigrant's home. It's as if, you know, Plato's saying to us, if you really want to rethink Athens, you want to rethink democracy, you need to think about it in its entirety all of the people, you know, what, what is membership really? So I think it's, a, it's that these are matters of contestation. They're not settled for the Greeks. And, um, and looking at the empire, thinking about what sustains Athens. Athens is not just Athens. It's sustained by, it's the metropole that's sustained by, you know, everything else, all these other peoples. And that that's, that is, as people are really saying that in the Q&A, there's this tension there. And I mean, if you think about Greek tragedy, um, it depicts, you know, women all the time in these various sort of like political um, conundrums. Um, obviously, Lysistrata is about, you know, a, a conspiracy by women to sort of take over the political life of Athens and, and make peace. Um, so even if women were not, you know, given the vote as someone, you know, is saying in, in the Q&A, there is a, a, a rich uh, dialogue happening among Athenian critics about really who should, who's in and who's out? It's a live question is what I'm trying to say, even if historically it doesn't look necessarily like that. You have, again, more parallels in the post-war period where at the height of American empire and hegemony, civil rights, second wave feminism and human rights centered initially around things like, you know, the Geneva Convention and around the rights of, of refugees and working its way into theorists like Hannah Arendt and a whole set of cosmopolitan theorists by, by the end of the century, the cutting edge of theory ends up being driven by similar kind of displacements in the modern period. Again, not to conflate, but. Yeah, Matt, can I, I just add one more thing before you, you yeah. jump in? I think that um, I probably too quickly dismiss the, the issue of immigration being important, um, I mean, I say I think it's important, but but I think it, in one regard um, we need to we need to consider uh, its import, which is to say that because citizenship was blood based in Athens, there is a kind of uh, exchange happening. There's a dialogue happening among critics about whether that should be the criterion for citizenship. What kind of democracy do you get when it's invested in nativism? Um, and I think you get an expansionist one. You get one that can go and, you know, subjugate other peoples in the name of a certain kind of ethnic superiority. Now, I think that that's, that's the rationale that's provided after the fact, right? But these things are, are, are important to kind of look at um, together that because citizenship was understood um, along ethnic lines, uh, you know, in an imperial context when people where Athenians could go and colonize and be Athenian and give birth to Athenians, you know, on, in these colonies. But these members of these colonies could not move to Athens and gain full citizenship. That's the kind of that's the that's the landscape, and that's provoking a set of questions about what citizenship really means. I'll follow up a little bit on, on what Dean is saying. Like, I mean, I sometimes am attracted to the to a kind of opposite. opposite counterfactual scenario, which so it's a counterfactual, so we can't we can't assess it. We don't know whether whether it will, what would have happened. But I think if Athens had actually been slightly more successful in its empire, it could have developed a more open conception of citizenship. So it, like uh, because basically, so when, you know, basically Athens almost takes over the entire Mediterranean world, right? So they 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 lose when they go to Sicily. But if they had taken Sicily, that's 
a great base of operations to take Italy, to take North Africa, the Carthaginian threat. So they could have been Rome. Uh, and just like Rome originally had an exclusivist citizenship body, uh, but eventually, you know, the allies, uh, the, you know, the social war in Rome is the war between the allies who are demanding Roman citizenship. So I think a counterfactual Athenian history could have developed a more capacious conception of citizenship, but it, but it never had the chance. And I think the nativism is, as I think was implicit in what Dimu was saying, is really tied in with the war effort too, because there are all these benefits that citizens get from, the, from, from war so I and from the empire. So it's, it's no coincidence that Athens tightens its laws about who can be a citizen uh, with Pericles' citizenship law. Uh, so that means you have to have, is it four Athenian grandparents, Demi, or just two Athenian parents? Yeah, so, so basically, you know, a half Athenian can no longer share in the benefits of citizenship. And that's because there's real material benefits flowing into the city, uh, plus real human beings flowing into the city from the empire. And they're, the people who, who have some claim on these resources are like, oh, these are, these are mine. They're not this guy who just came in from, you know, some crummy little town that we happened to conquer. And now he's a refugee and he wants some of my resources. No way. I mean, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's unsurprising uh, kind of a kind of mentality. Um, but and I also wanted to pick up a little bit on what Dimi was saying about like, you know, the fight over like who should really count as a citizen and, and you know, what, what, do, what does citizenship really mean? I think, and, and, and what makes a political community? Like, what is it that people have to share to be part of a political community together? I think that, uh, that that is a really important question in Greek political thought. And it comes out of their reflection on empire and democracy and oligarchy and this whole history that we've been talking about. So I, I'm gonna take a little chance here um, when you bring up this question, which I think could have a dark side to it because what do people have to share? Well, thick ties can be ugly. They're not just uh, positively normative. So I wanna ask John if he wants to chime in on whether any of what we've been talking about connects to a more a realist conception or a Machiavellian conception of, um, of democratic power and politics. Uh, well, well, certainly that, well, I'd prefer to hear Matt and Demi talk all, all evening. That would be great. Um, but, you know, the authors that Matt and Demi are talking about were, as they said, you know, pretty critical of democracy. Um, and so I think that gives um, concepts like stasis and demagoguery um, a, a kind of, uh, uh, and a, a pejorative, notion that Machiavelli didn't have about them. Uh, so he wouldn't have described the kind of conflict that beset the rich and poor in Greek cities as stasis. He would have said, it's, it's the rich trying to uh, extract more from the poor. It's the rich trying to dominate the poor more explicitly. He would have given it a one-sided uh, causality rather than Aristotle's kind of, well, they're both intransigently antagonistic. So there's there, there's that element. Um, I mean, I think the whole, you know, Machiavelli would have laughed at the idea of democratic erosion and the euphemism that that is, the kind of passivity of that. Democracies erode, popular governments erode, uh, de democratic republics collapse because the oligarchs destroy them. That, that's why it's not, it's not a natural occurrence like uh, the erosion of your beach, your local beach. Um, it's, it's somebody is actively trying to overthrow them. And, and you know, Machiavelli would, would say that all, all popular governments, uh, whether Athenian democracy or the Roman Republic or the republics of, of his day in Italy and in Switzerland are always uh, the objects of conspiracies against them by the oligarchs. And uh, the oligarchs are indispensable in establishing these regimes. They usually, um, some, some large portion of the wealthy decide that maybe we can do better under a republic or a democracy than under the autocracy we're living under, or maybe a democracy or a republic will 
um, arbitrate differences uh, among us oligarchs more peacefully than, than we're managing ourselves. And so they buy in, but very often they, they, they're unsatisfied with the results. And whenever that, whenever that dissatisfaction sets in, um, it, the first opportunity of a crisis, uh, the oligarchs will, will strike to, to overthrow the Republic. So we, we have, you know, the Peloponnesian War didn't cause oligarchic conspiracies against uh, Athens. It just gave an opportunity to hatch them. Um, in, in Rome, uh, once it was no longer possible for the Senate to uh, postpone the social question of distributing land, um, once Rome had defeated Carthage and had no viable enemies, uh, they resort to assassination and murder of Tiberius Gracchus uh, to prevent uh, the, the redistribution of, of wealth in Rome and basically set in motion Rome's collapse. So, um, so I think um, Machiavelli helps us think about um, the death of democracies in a kind of structural way that there's always, and this relates to contemporary America, right? And besides Machiavelli's Florence or Machiavelli's Rome, you know, I'm also familiar with the Weimar Republic. And, you know, there's an excellent recent book uh, called uh, The Death of Democracy, Hitler's Rise to Power and the Downfall of the Weimar Republic by Benjamin Carter Hett. And it's a, it's a terrifying book because the story there is that um, the center right in Weimar uh, rather than coalition with the center left, decides to play a game with the far right. Let's see how let's see how much we can control the Weimar Republic uh, ourselves by refusing to compromise with the center left, and let's use the far right to entrench our own power. And of course, that's a game that that they lose. The far the far right takes that power from them. Machiavelli saw the the Florentine. Uh, aristocrats play the same game with the Medici. Let's let's use the Medici. Let's bring the Medici back so we can overthrow the Florentine Republic, and then we'll have an aristocratic republic. Uh, no, the Medici come back and suppress suppress them. So I, I think there's just a pattern. I, I think that um, democracies are just susceptible to. Um, to the oligarchs, to the wealthy who were once split over their support of democracy, uh, kind of reaching a, a reconciliation about overthrowing them. And they become very well-resourced, uh, very cynical, uh, very aggressive force against the democracy and will you know, flout every norm uh, and if possible, violate every law to overcome uh, democratic institutions. Gee, that sounds so familiar. Where, where have I heard that before? <laughs> um, so it's, it seems like, first of all, there's a tension between an instrumental understanding of democracy as a means to an end and a normative understanding of democracy as a normative order. And, um, and so we've got two anonymous questions that kind of get at this in two different directions. One, um, asks about the short-term suspension of democracy, the use of a dictator or autocracy to get through an emergency to preserve the republic or a democracy. And, you know, the United States has had an extraordinary executive and imperial presidency as a consequence of that kind of logic starting in World War II and then continuing. Um, but then there's also the question of um, the sort of the opposite of that, not the suspension of it, but the return of democracy. So um, there's a question from Zizun Zhu who asks, uh, what does the resurgence of Athenian democracy from the aftermath of the Peloponnesian War suggest about the resilience of democracy, if anything? And I wanna emphasize here that there's a tendency to just talk about democracy like it's an actor. I mean, it's just a, it's a consequence of the, of the, of the language that we use. And, um, but, um, you know, how do we think about the sort of the, the gaps in democracy? It also gets to the question about slaves and women that can we even think of Athens as a democracy if most of the people are enslaved or silenced or excluded? Um, 
you know, what do we make of these suspensions and gaps and, and you know, not, not just outright assaults, but sort of in, the incompleteness of even Athenian democracy at its peak? Well, I, I'd just like to address that question related to the pluralism question that was raised earlier. I, I think the comparative set for Athens is not contemporary, multi, multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious uh, democracies, but Sparta and other oligarchies in their own world, which were which make Athens look incredibly pluralistic. That makes Athens look incredibly inclusive. Uh, if if you don't only think about the citizenship markers, right? So uh, Athens's critics, Plato, Xenophon, Zudo, pseudo Xenophon, you know, they thought Athens was was far too permissive in its. Uh, treatment of non-citizens. It's treatment, you know, pseudo-Xenophon complains. You can't, you know, you can't even slap a poor person on the street because it, you can't tell whether it's a citizen or a slave. So they have these laws that you can't slap, you know, a, a poorly dressed person in the street. That's outrageous, you know, um, or, or Plato uh, uh, satirizing, you know, even, in, even in, Ath in Athens, even dogs talk back to their, talk back to their masters. There's so, there's so much non, um, non-hierarchy there's such a you know uh, non-observance of of hierarchy and you know the the research on slavery is that you know there are just as there are enormously rich medics there are enormously rich slaves in athens as well that there's there's a lack of regulation you know and we're comparing this city to a city like sparta which doesn't allow foreigners number one you know women don't you know women are either even more excluded from public life because the men sleep with each other uh, in barracks um, and they kill their slave population periodically to keep them in line. So th that's the, you know, that's why. And if you add to that, the fact that Athens is, as Madame Dimi said, it, it did constitute a regime where the poor ruled the rich. You put all those things together. I think it's, I think it's okay to call Athens a democracy. But, but what do you make, and this, I want to bring Dimi and Matt in on this. Even so, what do you make of this, you know, suspensions or, or ex, uh, exceptions in a polity that is so much more democratic than the other polities? Does, does it have a significance? Not to say that it was false or non-existent, but what does it tell us about how it worked that it still had so many exceptions or conditions in which it could be suspended? I'll say something briefly about that. And then I also want to talk about these questions about resilience, which I think are really, really interesting. I mean, so I think democracy, right? I think it's, I, th I think what's striking about, about Athenian democracy is, is its openness to ordinary people uh, as understood by, by the cultural norms of the time, right? And so, People could, you know, people could imagine even more open regimes, like regimes Demi already mentioned, you know, in plays and in philosophy. Sometimes they imagine what would it be like for women to participate in politics. But that was not within most people's, you know, cultural can of the sense of the possible uh, and the realistic. Uh, and so that's the same, you know, for, for, for us today, thinking, thinking about a world state, it's probably similarly far away. Uh, and so, you know, so I think it, it would be great, maybe, but, but it doesn't, we don't, we, don't, we don't know how to get there from here. Uh, so, so I think, right, I think what, what makes it democratic is the sense that it, it's open to ordinary people. And then I think that's an idea that's unfolded, actually, I think, over time, and, and, and it's been contested. Who should count? Uh, and, and, and what, how can we, how can we think about bringing new people into the, the fold of our political community and giving them rights of participation and the ability to have a say. And I think, right, so I think this is, this is a particularly important moment in that history. So now I am, I, I'm trying not to be teleological because I don't think it's one directional, but I do think that, I do think that, you know, I would, I'd say we've made progress on the idea of what democracy really means. And I, I would defend that claim. Even if, even if there's no teleology in the history, I think conceptually and normatively we have made progress. So I'm understanding the idea. I guess I, you know, one thing that would be, I mean, almost to play devil's advocate and kind of go along with what Jim's proposing here, you know, Athens was actually 
notorious for being very hard on women. And um, women in Athenian women were more restricted than women in some other cities. They really were not supposed to be in public. Um, and they were financially also more restricted. So they weren't, uh, it's not clear if they were property holders in the same way that Spartan women were. Now that's interesting to me because it makes me wonder whether you know one way of, of, of thinking about what the privileges of democratic citizenship are, we might wanna think about how burdensome they are. They're actually, there's this, uh, you know, clear understanding among at least the critics of Athens that to really participate, you have to have the time to do it. You have to be out of the house doing it. The, the kind of emphasis on the public, the public space, um, the kind of transparency that's involved in the way that like the private domestic feminine sphere is important to keep kind of, you know, uncontaminated by that. Um, and so I'm just wondering whether, you know, there is something that we could, we could say more about why Athenians were so invested in this distinction. It's true that it was very rare for women to be politically empowered, but there were cases of that. There were the Amazons, there were cities that were known for being a little bit more lax. Um, so, but then of course, as John was saying, Sparta didn't even allow foreigners in. So, um, but it's interesting to think about sort of why what it was about the actual practice of Athenian politics that seemed to um, be constituted against why how it how it got its definition um, through those particular kinds of exclusions, the sort of androcentric nativist, you know, um, membership politics, at the same time, keeping in mind that who counts as part of the demos is a live question. It, the, the membership boundaries are, are for any polity, you know, always a question, always in, in flux. Well, wasn't that often raised in the question of who's the true enemy of the demos? Um, so we were in, before this, we, we had a little brainstorming session about uh, what the ground we'd like to cover. And one of the things that Matt raised was um, the problem of distinguishing between a truly democratic leader and a demagogue. Um, and, uh, you know, so like in the 20th century, Roosevelt was hated by conservatives as a demagogue, that man who took four terms, you know, the, who started the imperial presidency. If you're a conservative, that's a nightmare that didn't end when Roosevelt died because of the New Deal coalition. Um, if you're center left, of course, then that's the, the, the success of dem partial success of democracy, because there were many things that were not accomplished even um, in the New Deal. Uh, so how do we think about where to draw that line? I mean, now we have a lot of, we have bright line watch. We have this idea that we can draw lines between democracy and its, and its opposite, but are demagogues a creature of democracy uh, or is it better to think of them as a pathology? I mean, in the middle of the 20th century, my own work focuses on how insistently Cold War liberals were determined to pathologize democracy. So they, they absolutely saw dem demagogues as creatures of mass democracy. So you needed to limit and constrain, have a limited state and constrain the masses. So you wouldn't get too much democracy and it would turn into the terror. But this is an earlier period before anything like the Russian revolution was dreamt of. Um, what's the best way to think about demagogues and how are they different from really incredibly popular majoritarian democratic figures. So it's like, Jim, what you're asking is, is, is demagoguery really not just a kind of um, elite term? Of well, that's one way to put it. I mean, I, I definitely think that we can distinguish between demagogues and democratic leaders, but I think okay. as an, a philosophical exercise, it's a challenge to, to explain what are the criteria for deciding that a leader is a demagogue. And you really see this in uh, some of the worst parts of American history. I mean, if you look at sort of the darkest days of the Jim Crow South in the 1910s, 1920s, you now Pitchfork ben, ben Tillman, incredibly popular, mass support among poor whites as well as wealthier whites. Of course, this was in like a rotten borough system, so it wasn't that democratic electorally, but there were, you know, he was incredibly popular. Huey Long, who didn't play the race, was also incredibly popular. But can you call Huey Long a democratic leader? 
I, I, I wouldn't. And yet he clearly drew on democratic power. So I don't know, what, what are some conceptual tools we can draw on to, to distinguish between demagoguery and democratic leadership? <laughs> yeah, Matt, do you wanna? Yeah. Field that? I, I, think, I think it's actually a, a hard question. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm tempted to say that there's a kind of, so I think we, I think we could start by distinguishing along the lines that Jim was pointing out for us, right? So I think, I think people who are unhappy about democratization and who stand to lose from, you know, efforts at redistribution and, the, you know, paying for new social programs and things like that are going to look askance at anyone who is building a popular coalition uh, in that direction and are going to cast the, the accusation of demagoguery. And so I think we actually should take seriously the possibility that it's just like Demi was saying, it's just elite abuse to diffuse democracy. Uh, that should, I think we should take that as a serious possibility, but, but I, think there's, I think that if you look at the best critiques of demagoguery that you get in the ancient world, there's, there's more to it. And I'll, I'll add a couple of features that I think might, might help us think about this. So one thing I think the demagogues often provide is a kind of fantasy for citizens uh, that gives them like an, an aggrandized sense of their own power uh, channeled conveniently through the demagogue often, uh, and, and also of the kind of ease with which politics can happen, right? So the, the thought is, right, uh, we're going to get it, we're going to get some big thing done and we're gonna get it done quickly and easily and there's going to be no, we don't have to consider the downsides and the costs, uh, and this, this, this is where we're going and this is gonna be great. And I think that's that kind of fantasy, I think, uh, I think democracies in any regime where decision makers are prone to, to wishful thinking, uh, you, you know, that's, that's a problem. And then I think the other side of it too is, which I think helps to bring out the sense of, the sense of unity and self-aggrandizement is, is often picking on, on some smaller group uh, as the target of your, uh, you know, net, there's, there's, so you, you, you mobilize around a goal and then you also mobilize around an enemy. And if you do both of those, you, you, you're onto something pretty powerful. Sometimes that smaller group can be the wealthy and the, the distant wealthy. And sometimes it can be uh, the many, but the, the disempowered many, the poor. Uh, does that matter if the enemies are uh, potentially, you know, are, are very powerful, or is it just about mobilizing fears of a distant power around scapegoats? Do you mean does it matter normatively or politically, or, or it, it, either way? Honestly, like, yeah, I mean, to, I, I, th I think, I think, I think that generally this form of politics often doesn't end well. well I'll just leave it at that. So I think, like, you know, John and I might disagree on this. Uh, but, but you know, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I think, you know, I think it's noteworthy that Athens, after the oligarchic coups, did not, they, they basically told the rich people after the second time they tried to destroy every, the whole city, they said, you guys can either get the hell out of town, uh, like go into exile or start playing by the rules. Uh, and they managed to then make democracy a going concern again for a century. Uh, pretty stable regime, uh, basically until Alexander ended the game for everyone. Uh, so, so you know, I think I think they would have, like as Aristotle recognizes, they would have been well within the rights to just string up all the rich uh, and uh, and go on without them. Uh, and they chose not to. And I think and I think I think that the decision worked for them to not do so. And I think that's you know worth worth thinking about. Demi or John, do you want to jump in on this? Well, I just, I thought you were, the way you posed the question about who the enemy is, if, I mean, that's the distinction between left and right wing populism, right? I mean, if, if, if the enemy is the wealthy few and we're going to expropriate them, um, that's left wing populism and that's normatively defensible, I think. Uh, and if, you know, if the, uh, if the enemy are, you know, is, are, you know, far Im immigrants or ethnic or religious minorities who, you know, in being minorities are actually quite vulnerable and not powerful at all. Well, that's, that's right-wing populism and that's not morally defensible. 
Amy? Yeah, I was just going to say something about um, demagoguery and it's kind of the inherent ambiguity. Um, because I mean, if you break it down, you know, the, the Greek verb, it's like to lead, to lead the demos. Now, of course, there's this question about um, persuasion that's implicit here is persuasion, which, you know, so with the beginning of democracy, you get this just like big concern about speech and about its um, is speech. I mean, you see this with, with in, in Gorgias's encomium of Helen, when is speech like force? When is it deceit? When it, is it something that you're actually, you know, actively engaging with and, and judging? Um, and these were questions that the Greeks posed because there's a, there's a deep um, mistrust or a worry about the, uh, but, but also just an acknowledgement of the polyvocal meaning of facts or of, well, maybe not facts, but definitely the words, right? And, and also how they could be, how in the practice of sort of, of relaying them, um, you know, you are offering an interpretation. And so who is going to do that talking to people or what is it just the sort of acknowledgement of the rhetorical dimension of, of speech um, and its persuasiveness. And sometimes that's gonna look like, you know, you're being tricked and sometimes it's gonna look like you're being convinced. And that's, a, that's a, again, that's something that they're really, they're really worried about. So I don't know if it's always, now there are demagogues who are deceiving the people but then there are demagogues who are also sort of, I mean, in Plato's account, it's like he says something in book six of the Republic, he talks about how kind of being with the people, being an orator basically um, is learning to be with a wild animal, understanding its wants and its needs, and basically accommodating those wants and needs. You mirror back to the people what they want. You're a flatterer. You're someone who gets in their good graces. So. That's, I mean, that's a form of activity, but I don't know how active or transformative it is. Um, and yet, as Matt was saying, there's this inclination to sort of imagine politics. I don't know if this is really what you were saying, but in this kind of simplistic way, just that there's a demagogue that's leading the people. And actually maybe that would be really great to be led to a decision very simply, um, but it's also a fantasy of how um, politics works, right? That's a, a, you could say it's even a kind of paranoid um, fantasy that there is one person sort of not, in this case, not behind the scenes, kind of out in the open doing everything. Um, so it's, maybe it's not that paranoid, but it's definitely a, a simplification. I'm tempted to, to go in two different directions. Uh, one is to take the bait from uh, the recent discussion of enemies and ask if that's a little too Schmidtian, if we need to think of pol politics grounded in agonism without considering its opposite, you know, the opposite of stasis. Uh, Demia, you, I, I can't pronounce this word. It's not eunomia, but it's... Um, well, Matt, you were gonna address this, the, the, that there are two possible, sorry, one is homonoia. Um, yeah. And what was the other one that you were thinking of? Um, I, I, the term I found was eunomia, but I'm not a classicist, so I don't, the idea is like good government, civic action, mm -hmm. cooperation, kind of the mm -hmm. opposite of this more agonistic definition of politics that we've been working with. And it seems like that's got to be in there too. I mean, we kind of got to it through the discussion of trust and belonging, but um, Matt, I don't know if you want to chime in on that or if it, we also have other questions in the queue that we could go to if you feel like we've talked that out. I mean, I'll, I'll, so I think this is, I think, so I think as, I think that this, you know, when I was saying like at the end of the, at the end of the war, right? Uh, when they, when they're, they're choosing whether to kick the oligarchs out or whether the oligarchs are gonna come back in and be part of the new democracy. The, the word that, that the, the word homonoia that Dimi is, is referencing for us, which you could translate as like one, literally it's like one-mindedness, but you could translate as concord or you could give it a less highfalutin translation and just call it agreement, right? It's coming to an agreement. Uh, that, that word becomes really important. It's actually probably coined around this time. And it's part of the sort of democratic ideology into the fourth century that the city has come back to some kind of, of agreement. And, so I actually, so so I I actually think that this is a question. This is like 
this is an important question for us to be thinking about. So someone asked in the, in the, in the Q&A, like, what can reset democratic norms, right? So like after a period of, of erosion uh, or a period where we're, we're, we're undergoing these moments in this time where we're, where we're all disoriented uh, and the kinds, of, the kinds of like destabilizing and atomizing uh, features of our politics like that Demi was talking about at the beginning of our, of our panel are, are features of our political life. What, what could reset this? And I think like, I don't know, I think, I think that, uh, that that's a pretty urgent question to me. Uh, I think you need, you need something that, that enables people, and I think this is, this is sort of the Platonic and Aristotelian view, you need something uh, that enables the people, in, the, the people in a political community to understand themselves as part of a whole. And that doesn't have to be, so Jim, you, you, when we talked about this a little earlier, you, you were worried that this has to be really thick, right? So this is like the, the specter of thick ties that then often means if there's thick ties between some of us, there's probably some people who aren't included in the thick ties and you just start the friend enemy distinction all over again. But I don't think it has to be like that. I think, I think the hope uh, is that there can be a kind of agreement that's brought to, that's, you know, put in place through institutions and education probably, uh, and some kind of civic understanding that is the basis for, for political stability of a kind and for, for a, a kind of political community. But, you know, whether, whether, how you reset that, I think is the big question that we're gonna have to think about if our politics isn't going to get a lot worse. It, maybe it has to do with not whether there's a friend enemy distinction or an agonism driving politics along with cooperation, trust, consensus, norms, whatever you want to call them. Maybe it has more to do with how the agonism is configured and how norms create boundaries for that competition to make it uh, sustainable. Yeah, well, I mean, so I also think, right, I think in a certain way, like, this, and this is a Schmidtian point, right? So I think when you, if you think that, you know, democracy, if you think that the winning side in a democracy is everyone, like the people won, then you're automatically going to think that the losers aren't part of the people. And then this is very quickly going to become vicious, right? So I think we need, you know, I think, I think the Platonic and Aristotelian, one, one of their critiques of democracy is Trying to trying to reimagine politics such that it doesn't habitually involve creating winners and losers that see the other side as a threat. Uh, now I think that's not easy to do, and they recognize it's not easy to do. Uh, but I think the appeal of it is just to avoid these kinds of destabilizing dynamics. Yeah, in U.S. history, C. Van Woodward famously observed that the uh, white upper class in the South um, after reconstruction collapse successfully established right wing populism by, by tricking poor whites into thinking that African Americans were their enemies. And, um, and that's been the basis for a hair and bulk democracy ever since. And this ties into a question that came to us from the audience about um, wanting a little more uh, discussion of John's definition of right wing populism you know, asking us, don't, the, uh, don't they attribute the influx of outsiders in a polity or in the Jim Crow South, the, you know, the, the, the conditions of, of the African-American community um, to the attractiveness of cheap labor to the wealthy few that enables exploitation. So in this respect, the right wing attributes culpability both to outsiders and the few, the latter causes the appearance of the former. So this has to do with like, who is able to define who the enemy is. So that it goes back to the friend enemy distinction, but the, 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 the response to that in ancient Greece or in, in the late 19th century South doesn't have to be a sort of a, an oppositional agonism. It could be to redefine who can work together, right? To not accept that distinction. If um, Southern populace had successfully formed an alliance with the Colored Farmers Alliance, for example, maybe that could have been preemptive. Um, here, I think historical specificity makes it hard to generalize about where populism is going to go. So we have a, another question in here that goes in a somewhat different direction, but it picks up on some of the things Demi was saying earlier, I think, or at least it could be brought into conversation with it. Um, Demi, you were talking about language 
the destabilization of um, maybe not meanings exactly, but usage or context or uh, interpretations of, of language. Um, and Linda Zerilli, a, a, one, a member of our faculty on, in political science, has sent in a question about the current sort of obsession with truth and, and fake politics. And she wants to know, um, you know, uh, what are we getting wrong about the sources of the crisis? I'm thinking in particular, she writes, about the almost obsessive focus on the question of truth, the attack on truth, so-called post-truth politics. Is this focus something of a red herring when we consider what the Greeks can teach us about the sources of democratic erosion? So I just wanna relate her question to this issue of semantic flux and get at this assumption again that we tend to have today that we have to have a consensus on norms and meanings um, you know, the definition of what is is <laughs> can't be lawyered on the left. And the, you know, the meaning of things like torture or democracy can't just be argued away on the right. Um, but is, is this focus on both sort of empirical truth in the form of just factual reporting about things like COVID and then sort of more like semantic honesty about the way we use language when we talk about tyranny, um, in, you know, in contemporary politics. Is that the issue or is it just kind of epiphenomenal in a way? And what really matters is that, you know, the 1% have arrogated all the surplus value of the economy for the last 40 years, despite rising productivity. That's a, that's a modern present centered way of asking you in, in, you know, in ancient Athens, do you think that language and, and debates over truth and deeming rumors were really fundamentally destabilizing or were they more symptoms of structural destabilization? I mentioned okay. that the, sorry, what? No, I hope I haven't butchered Linda's question trying to relate it to language. No, it's a great question. I mean, the beginning, at the beginning of, um, of our discussion, I mentioned that Thucydides tries to um, identify the symptoms of stasis or stasis. And one of the symptoms is uh, like the semantic instability that um, words don't change their meaning, but as you were saying, Jim, they, they are used differently. They're used simultaneously to mean contradictory things in some cases, or more like people. So I used the example at the beginning of kind of this like reckless behavior that starts to actually look uh, brave. And um, people are not unaware that it's still reckless, but there's a kind of, um, there's a simultaneous um, use of, of both of those possibilities, but maybe more importantly, um, there's a kind of um, interest in, in disrupting the usual meaning. There's a kind of pleasure that's taken according to Thucydides in this, in this sort of behavior. Um, so, you know, it's hard for me to answer uh, Linda's question fully, but I would say that, you know, maybe one thing we have to think about is, is whether the Greeks have this idea of factual truth that is so clearly distinguishable from um, truth. For them, I mean, if you think about Thucydides and his account, it's an accounting, it's a kind of witnessing of the events of the war, and he gives multiple perspectives um, within that. It's not just his first person perspective. And, um, and yet there is this increasing worry. So I think it is a bit of a red herring in the sense that there's this like, along with this um, economic and political instability, there's this uh, increased suspicion about deception and that all language is kind of misleading and that people are misleading each other. And you know, Thucydides talks really beautifully about the moment when democracy um, kind of falls or right before it, when there's a lot of suspicion in the air and there's this fear that there's actually been a conspiratorial um, uh, uh, effort to overtake, to overthrow democracy. And he says that they kind of, the, the demos could not get to the bottom of it, that it was all hearsay and that people had different opinions and no one can say for sure what happened, right? So I think it is just a feature, at least in Thucydides, of this moment, but it's not necessarily the cause. And I don't think that the Greeks would say that nobody knew the, the truth, but there's some kind of that there's a there's a lack of trust, and maybe it's just not given the importance any longer 
Um, because even that kind of, he says, this prudential um, way of thinking and dealing with facts is no longer valued. It's about actually being almost like um, vigilant and, and sort of pig-nosed about what you think. It's no longer a democratic value, actually, I think, to weigh things the way it, it had been before. Just to follow on that, I think the other thing more important than truth in these contexts, at least on Thucydides' analysis, uh, was something like, like a shared orientation and understanding, uh, right? And so what's really, what's really happened is that people are, people's, you know, perceptions of the political world no longer converge on certain very basic understandings and kind of world pictures. And that I think should be very familiar to us right now. And so, you know, I, the, the passage that, that Dimi's discussing in Thucydides, um, you know, it's picked up, for those of you in, in classics of social and political thought, it's picked up by Hobbes who you'll see next quarter is gonna say things like, you know, some people call prudence what other people call this, and some people call wisdom what other people call, you know, mere smartness. I, you know, this is like, for Hobbes, Hobbes' view is that this is just like a fact about humans as individuals and we're, you know, he's a kind of skeptic about what, how people use language very generally, but for him, it's a point about individuals. For Thucydides, it's a point about how social groups and political dynamics lead to these kind of very, very different understandings of the world. Uh, and what's, what's, you know, so I think, I think that's, that's what's going on there. And I think, you know, the, the causes of it again, right, in the ancient world would have been very different than, than the causes of it today, right? They don't have Twitter, uh, but, but the, the kind of disorienting uh, and like loss of shared, shared understandings part of it, I think, you know, is what I get when I talk to my neighbor. I'm, I'm in Ohio right now. Uh, and my neighbor, Larry's probably not watching this. Hi, Larry. Uh, you know, my neighbor is, you know, probably a Trump voter. And, you know, we talk in like, it takes us a good, if we talk about politics, which we do once a month, probably, it takes us a good 10 minutes to enter each other's worlds. You know, and I only do it because I see him all the time next door. Otherwise, you know, he's probably the only Trump voter I talk to on a regular basis. Uh, and it really takes a while for us to see the world at all the same. Well, the, John, do you want to chime in on this? Well, I, I think, Dimi, yeah. Just very quickly, I, I want to add that um, while it's a symptom, the, the sort of the questions about truth um, and, the, and this use of, of, of words I was talking about before is a symptom of maybe what we'd call erosion or stasis, it can also lead to regime collapse or coups in the sense that, like, I mean, what Thucydides is interested in is how people end up becoming so fearful and unsure of things and unsure of the truth that they kind of, be, they, they're paralyzed actually. And they allow, you know, certain figures or groups to take control of a regime of the democracy right before their eyes. Um, so I don't want to say that it's not then a kind of cause or you know factor in in collapse um, because I think it is but there's the question of whether or not the cause is because of failure of what someone like Habermas would call communicative action or is it a failure of a kind of shared moral normative universe or is it a, a lack of information it, it seems like this problem raises really serious questions about the possibility of the rule of law if you don't have, you know, you, you have posses and sheriffs declaring themselves constitutional authorities throughout the country right now um, because they reject the, 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 the established constitutional law and the state and, and federal laws um, that have been you know, prevailing in the United States for, you know, since uh, for, throughout the 20th century. And um, it seems like if you don't have a stable uh, horizon of reference, um, stable set of meanings, and, and that they don't refer to a shared social world, it's very hard to imagine how the law could operate. And it seems like the law in the ancient world was very different from the law in the modern world. Do you want to mention, is that something that has to do with how stable democracy was then? 
like courts, juries, that kind of thing? Well, I mean, maybe I'll leave um, some of that to Matt, but I, I want to just say in response that, um, yeah, the, the, one of the signs of, of this kind of um, erosion, what we're calling erosion or collapse, is um, a lawlessness that extends to a shift in convention. So nomos for the Greeks is both law and customs um, that are, you know, pretty naturalized. They really do, especially for Aristotle, make up um, a politeia. They make up a, a polis's way of life. And that actually the most important thing for him are those things um, that are not necessarily laws in, our, in, in the way we use laws, but the things that a, that, that a society is, is bound together by, their conventions. And those things, people transgress those all the time in, in Thucydides' account of, of stasis. Um, and that is, so I forgot the, the beginning of your, of your question, but I think that that's definitely, it's a huge, it's a huge issue. And I think for, for Aristotle, it's the first concern is how do you maintain those? Because then if you can, you will avoid the kind of um, serious political, the convulsions that, that we're seeing right now. Matt, do you want to say anything about juries or? laws or anything. I didn't mean to bring in the rule of law as a red herring because it's also used as a polemical actors category to shut down democracy. But it is now suddenly of, of great uh, value to liberals uh, in a way that it wasn't 30 or 40 years ago because it was used by uh, ideological actors to try to hem in sort of executive, you know, executive action and, and uh, unaccountable uh, legislatures and just sort of like legalize politics. Um, but, uh, you know, it seems like the, it's just the way that juries worked were, was very different and the whole concept of what the law was, was very different. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, there was the, the, the most distinctive feature in a, in a democracy was basically the control of ordinary citizens over the interpretation and the, the, the interpretation of the law, uh, the, uh, the execution of the law and over whether laws should be changed uh, or not, right? So, so basically that the legal system was in the hands of ordinary, of ordinary people and it was relatively hard, I think, to, to use the legal system, uh, broadly speaking, to subvert to subvert what ordinary people thought was was their interest, right? So like null, like not jury nullification is the is the is the law of the land, right? If the, the citizens don't want to vote for something, they don't have to vote for it, right. uh, and that was a protected right. So did they have any concept of um, judicial review, which was a federalist invention to to hem back the Jeffersonian Democrat? Well, it's judicial review by the people. So there is judicial review, and so decrees in the assembly. Uh, can be challenged on the grounds of their illegality or their being inexpedient. Uh, but the final decision is in the hands of a panel of ordinary citizens. You know, basically, to dis you know, instead of kicking it up to nine justices in the Supreme Court, they kick it to a, a room, you know, not a, yeah, but either a building or outside, a panel of 500 ordinary citizens who listen to the legal arguments. The laws are read to them. It's incredibly regular. So if you look in, and institutionalized. So if you look at uh, Aristotle's Constitution of Athens. The last, you know, it's not a very long document, and the last eight pages are basically <laughs> devoted to like the procedure of how to impanel the jurors and how to make sure that the cases run on time. So they put a lot of thought into getting it right, into understanding how ordinary citizens could plausibly have control of this highly technical. Argument. So if they if they can impanel the jurors, we can count our votes. As what you're we hope so. <laughs> Presumably, it should be a little more straightforward. All right, I want to take us out on uh, a question from Bella Hoba. Um, she asked, how can we in our modern democracies prevent the rise of a modern Alcibiades to power? And could you discuss the practice of ostracism in Athens? I don't know if you can answer both of those because we only have a few minutes, but I think that is the question of the day. Either of you or any of you want to take a crack at it? Or what, what did the Athenians think you could do or should do? Well, they had 
harsher punishments for bad behavior in office than than we do, right? And that that was a uh, a deterrent, right? You could ostracize uh, such people. You could execute such people. We don't we don't really have uh, that at our disposal. Um, as as Matt said, you know, all, those very things are in the hands of ordinary people. Uh, to impeach a president is like you know, it's like brain surgery. Uh, it's, 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 I mean, if you think that like the generals are the most high, that the highest elected officials in Athens are elected, you elect ten of them, not one. You elect them for one year at a time, and you know, probably I don't know the figures, but but it, it wouldn't surprise me if something like fifteen or twenty percent of them ended up impeached over the you know over the course of the the, 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 the city's history. So. So basically, right, like there was just much more assertive control. And you can't, so you can't necessarily stop the rise of an Alcibiades or a Trump, but you can cut it off as soon as you realize that it's the wrong move. Well, what's also interesting about Alcibiades is that you can cut him off, but then he can go conspire with the enemy, right, with foreigners and kind of come back in and try to take take over democracy in other ways, or he becomes a scapegoat. I mean, it's not clear, right, like how much was Alcibiades responsible for what happened to the Athenians? Um, right? How much were they really just deflecting um, onto this notoriously um, charismatic, beautiful, right, persuasive person? Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a conspiracy is, is, is there um, at the end of the day, even with ostracism. Well, was ostracism an effective tool? Because it seems to me that it could lead very easily to faction and civil war. And in, in fact, that ostracism is a, like a special practice that is a form of, of expelling moral turpitude that you know could, depending on the alignment of, of interest groups, could actually make it difficult to, to, to maintain unity uh, of purpose. Ostracism ends up not being used uh, after, a, you know, sometime in the fifth century. And the last ostracism we know about uh, actually involved a kind of strategic manipulation of the vote. And it seems, you know, we'd, um, we're, historians are speculating here, but it seems plausible that people, for just that reason, the reasons you're pointing to Jim, but ostracism isn't a regularized enough process. And we need something that's more institutionalized and that's uh, leaves less room for some of the ways in which ostracism could be manipulated. So you get a different set of accountability institutions in the in the fourth century that worked on the whole pretty well. Yeah, I mean, when Clinton was impeached, his popularity went up. Um, so anyway, but this gets again to the idea of like well, where we place norms in power when we think about democracy and how what what work they do. All right, well, we've gotten to 802 and we've covered a lot of really interesting ground. I still don't know what the heck is gonna happen on Tuesday, but I have a much better sense of, of what I ought to read or the kinds of things I ought to read to think about it. And for that, I'm indebted to you all and to the audience for asking such excellent questions. Um, thank you very much. I'm gonna let you all have your weekend back now and, 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 um, and just feel grateful that we can have this kind of a conversation at the University of Chicago. Thanks so much, Jim and Dean and, and everyone in the audience. Thanks for coming, yeah. Thanks. Bye. Members of the panel, if you would like to stay for a moment after feedback, I'm going to uh, remove the MBTs, then we can have a little feedback reunion. Okay. Have you done that, Ruben? No, um, we're doing it as we.